In today's video, I want to introduce you to a very important function called w equal to e to the z, the complex exponential function. Now, z here can be expanded as e to the x plus i times y, and we write this as e to the x times e to the i y. So this is how we define the complex exponential function for all complex numbers z. And a quick look at the polar form for w, I'm going to write this as, oh, terribly sorry about that, I'm going to write this as rho times e to the i theta. If this equals e to the x times e to the i y, then because y is just some real number, we can invoke Euler's formula and write this as e to the x times the cosine of y plus i times the sine of y. And if this equals rho times e to the i theta, and again we can expand e to the i theta as the cosine of theta plus i times the sine of theta, then equating the real and imaginary parts leads us to conclude that rho must be e to the x as in the modulus of w or the modulus of e to the z that is equals e to the x as in if you want the absolute value of e to some complex number you just raise e to the real part of that number and similarly the argument of w would be the y variable as in the imaginary part of the complex input z. And because of the way the function is defined, that is e to the x times e to the i y, where this thing here is, as we know, 2 pi periodic. So that means the exponential function e to the z is periodic as well. But what exactly is the time period in this case? Well, if you take e to the z and replace z by z plus 2 pi k times i, then we can expand this as e to the x plus i y plus 2 pi k i. And collecting the imaginary part terms, we have x uh, plus i times y plus 2 pi k. And this, of course, can be expanded as e to the x times e to the i y plus 2 pi k, which can be expanded further as e to the x times e to the i y times e to the 2 pi k i. And this thing was just e to the z, and this thing is, of course, equal to 1. So all of this implies that e to the z plus 2 pi k i equals e to the z, as in the period of this function is... 2 pi k i, where k is, of course, some integer. This is, of course, in stark contrast to the real-valued exponential function, which we know and love as an injective function. But because of the way e to the z is defined, it makes for some cool transformations, geometrically speaking. So here I have my two complex planes, one being the z plane, and the other is the w plane. And we're considering transformations from z plane to w plane under w equals e to the z. And let's take up two cases for curves in the w plane. I'm talking about horizontal and vertical lines. Starting off with the horizontal lines case, if I draw a horizontal line and traverse this from left to right, then what is the shape of the transformed curve in the W plane. Well, let's take a moment to look at what exactly a horizontal line means. Well, a horizontal line just means that I've fixed the imaginary part of each complex number z here to some number a. And what does that mean for e to the z? Well, we saw earlier that if we define w as e to the z, then the absolute value of w is e to the real part of z, that is x, and the argument of w equals y, that is the imaginary part of z. So fixing the imaginary part to some number a means that all complex numbers on the transformed curve in the w plane will be inclined at a radians relative to the positive real axis. And because we're traversing the 
line in the z plane from left to right, that means the x values are increasing. So if the x values are increasing, that means the moduli of complex numbers in the w plane is also increasing. So we're moving outwards from the origin, and all the vectors are going to be inclined at a radians to the positive real axis. What shape comes to mind? Obviously, rays. So the horizontal line in the z plane is transformed into this ray in the w plane inclined at a radians relative to the positive real axis. Bear in mind that we've excluded the origin, so I've just drawn this hole around the origin to show that it's not included. Why are we excluding the origin? Well, because of this e to the x term. We know that e to the x is never zero, so that means the absolute value of zero uh, of w can never be zero. So we have w not equal to zero. We have to exclude that. And of course, if I just increase the height of the horizontal line in question, then all I get is a ray at a steeper inclination. And what if I fix the imaginary part of z to be some negative number? Well, we know that negative values of the argument can mean clockwise rotations relative to the positive real axis. So the corresponding curve in the w uh, in the w realm would be the corresponding purple ray in the w plane. So we've concluded that horizontal lines are mapped onto rays. But what about vertical lines? Well, a vertical line in the z plane just means that we've fixed the real part of each complex number, complex input z, to be some number, call it a. And what does this mean for the w variable? Well, w equals e to the z equals e to the x times e to the i y, and e to the x is now just e to the a times e to the i y, and let's call this e to the a term as the real number r. So w equals r times e to the i y, which is the equation of a circle centered at the origin of radius r. And if we're traversing this vertical line in the upward manner, which means that the imaginary part of z is increasing, and the imaginary part of z is, of course, the argument of w. So the argument of w is increasing, which means that we're traversing the circle in the counterclockwise sense. So this is exactly what we get, a circle of radius r equal to e to the a centered at the origin in the w plane. Shifting this vertical line in the z plane leftwards means that you have a smaller radius for the circle. Okay, cool. And of course, shifting it rightwards means that you have circles of bigger radii. So we see that horizontal lines are mapped onto rays, whereas vertical lines are mapped onto circles, which is a pretty cool geometric transformation. The properties of the complex exponential are analogous to those of its real-valued counterpart. And you can prove them all pretty easily using the definition I outlined at the beginning of the video. So the first property is that if you have complex numbers z sub 1 and z sub 2, then e to the z sub 1 times e to the z sub 2 equals e to the z sub 1 plus z sub 2. And the proofs of these properties are left as an exercise. The second property is that 1 by e to the z equals e to the negative z. And maybe I should outline this. So 1 by e to the z can be expanded as 1 by e to the x times 1 by times e to the uh, i times y. And this, of course, can be written as 1 by e to the x times 1 by e to the i times y, which we know equals e to the negative x times e to the negative i y, which is, of course, e to the negative x plus i y, which is, of course, e to the negative z. See? It's easy. And the third property is, again, for complex numbers z sub 1 and z sub 2, such that e to the z sub 1 divided by e to the z sub 2 equals e to the z sub 1 minus z sub 2. And finally, we have one more important property related to the conjugate. So the conjugate of e to the z equals e to the conjugate of z, which is pretty cool. And now for some homework. 
So there's some light homework for today from Gamelin's text exercise 1.5, questions 1 and 2. Be sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons for extra credit. And in case you need any help, you can DM me on Instagram. And in case you're interested in some cool math for fun, subscribe to my main channel, Maths505. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something. Thank you. See you next time.